Good morning. Nice to have you with us this morning on Open Mind. And in celebration of National Library Week, I'm delighted to have two guests in the studio who are going to talk to us about libraries and who have had a lot of work to do in this field and help to bring it about. So let me get, introduce to you now my guests. First, Mrs. Beth Hyman, who is a former librarian and chairman of the Library Development Committee of the Oklahoma Library Association, and I believe vice chairman of the Legislative right. Code for Libraries, right? And then Earl Sneed, who really needs no introduction, is Vice President of Liberty National Bank, past Chairman of the National Library Week, and Chairman of the Citizens Committee for the Library Code. Right. Nice you? to have you both with me today. Thank you. And I think we'll start right off by talking a little bit about the, uh, the libraries that, you know, in Oklahoma, per se. Earl, maybe you ought to give us a background of the code that was recently passed in legislature. Well, as I uh, see it, the code and the necessity for it really began in 1960 when the people of Oklahoma approved by referendum, that is a vote of the people, an amendment to the Constitution of the State of Oklahoma, which for the first time, Bill, provided a really foundation method, a solid method of financing libraries. Up until that time, libraries had been financed just by an allocation of money from the various city councils. And since libraries uh, don't uh, have a lot of voter strength behind them and so on, why the library allocation would usually come right at the end of the budget. This I know because I was mayor of Norman and we used to do this. Yes. <laughs> Whatever you see was left over went to the libraries. And just to give you some figures so you can tell the vast difference this has made, we used to allocate 20000 a year for our library in Norman, keeping in mind that Norman is a university town. There are many people there who read. We have great need for library services. But in 1960, the people adopted this amendment, which says simply this, that upon petition of 10% of the voters or upon submission by the county commissioners, the people may vote upon themselves not less than one mill and not more than two mills as a levy, a levy upon our property, and that money will be used for libraries. And I'm certain that uh, when this was put in, why people thought, well, no one will vote a tax upon themselves. But they have, and they did in Norman while I was still mayor, and we voted for a two mill levy. And just to show you how dramatic this can be in the nature of libraries money, we went just overnight from $20,000 to 90000 well, what a difference that made. It made a <laughs> tremendous difference. So when you get money, and you can buy books, and you can hire librarians, and so on, then's when you start needing a code, and that's, of course, where Beth comes in. Well, that was a regular revolution. In it history really was. It Oklahoma. truly was. Well, now, Beth, tell us something about the code, per se. I understand you had something to do with its origination. Yes, the code was first... Uh, we began thinking about the code, as, the, as Dean Sneed said, when, when we began to have money available for libraries. And this money is available for libraries on a regional basis. When counties go together, they can vote this money. Because we feel in Oklahoma, that is the way to develop libraries. Uh, when this, w this great interest in libraries began, we began to see that we needed to go back and recodify the laws relating to libraries. Many of them were out of date, some of them were no longer usable at all. And so we set out to do it. Uh, there was a resolution calling for an interim study, and then a committee was established. We, we call it ELSI, lovingly. It was the Library Legislative Conference Committee. And this was a very interesting committee. I, I have never had an experience quite like it. How it, long did the committee... We worked for two years. Work. Two years? And it, this committee was made up of people all over the state. We almost always had at least 25 to 30 people who met twice a month and coming from all over the state. And uh, we Mostly librarians? No, well, there were librarians, there were library trustees, there were school people, there were attorneys. There journalists? Were journalists, that's well, right. Representative. Mac McGalliard from Ardmore was the chairman, and he is a newspaper man. Mrs. Elizabeth Coe uh, from Oklahoma City it was the, the 
other chairman. These people, first we were going to just change the laws, and then we saw that we needed to rewrite them from the beginning. And so we set out by using subcommittees, reporting back, starting over. It was a struggle. Mm -hmm. And so it was introduced then, and has the code been passed? Yes, it was passed. When? Oh, about uh, two weeks, weeks ago, ago. It was signed by the governor. Last week. So now last it's in week. effect. Yes, right. it's in effect right. now. Well, now tell me, Earl, what, uh, well, what restrictions or what path well, is this open for libraries in Oklahoma? The uh, code, again, I got back to the Constitution that I mentioned in 1960 because it was very important, this aspect, not only the money bill, but also the idea that a county of less than 250,000, which of course were all counties except Tulsa and Oklahoma City, could not use this money that I was telling you about unless they joined with another county. See, so that's where we get the multi-county library concept. For instance, Cleveland County and McLean and Garvin have joined together, and then there's another uh, county library, the Chickasaw, over at uh, Grady. Well, this code, in a sense, implements that, or lays down some ground rules for these counties and the cities within the counties to work together. And this makes a lot of sense because you can obviously buy a lot more books and have better librarians and better facilities if several counties go together. But Earl, does this mean that in the counties together, this means they would have an individual library in each county? Yes. But together they work for the That's betterment right. of all three. In uh, our example, why we have a local library board that looks after our local situation, and then people from that local board are on the multi-county board. And you know, Bill, uh, Beth may not want to say this, but I can't, librarians are hard to find. I mean, they're in short supply. So if you put two or three or four counties together, then you can hire a real top flight librarian to look after it all. And after all, we're not in horse and buggy, you know. We can travel, and this makes it good. And then, of course, the thing that I like the best about it is that they can put books in a bookmobile and take it out to the youngsters in the farm. And this is happening quite a bit in Oklahoma? Yes, there are two um, multi-county libraries now in existence, two regional libraries. Uh, there is another one that's in a demonstration period. Uh, federal funds are available with state funds for a demonstration period to get uh, uh, established. established before the, uh, the uh, taxes are voted. We, we found out that people were not prepared to vote taxes for a non-existent thing. And so with federal money, they, uh, after the original uh, petition has been made and, and it has been set up. The state library sets up a demonstration which lasts for a year or more in which they provide the books, the bookmobiles, the librarians and all, and people get a taste of what it's really like to get good library service. Most of these people have never had library service. And then uh, the tax is voted. Uh, they get to keep the bookmobile and the books as a core collection, and then they're on their own. Who would you say, Beth, that's perhaps done as much for Oklahoma libraries as any other single person in Oklahoma? No, I think we'd have to say Mr. Lowe. I think Ed Lowe, the, and I'm from the University of Oklahoma, basically, but I think Ed Lowe of Oklahoma State University is probably Mr. Library. And I understand he's retiring this year. Yes, um, unfortunately. I hope he's not retiring from libraries in general, but he, he will have to retire from OSU this year. And he is leaving the state. He's did going to teach in Michigan. Did they have a testimonial dinner for him? Yes, and it was very exciting. As we were planning it, I kept saying, now let's make this library, this meeting very exciting for Mr. Lowe. And I understand and Beth came in on this too, didn't she? she receive an award at this meeting? Yes, she did. She received what I is know, this Library of the Year or something. This library service yes. award, is yes. that right? I, I told Mr. Lowe, I kept telling him that it should be exciting, but I didn't mean that they were to excite me also. But well, I, came I, I was surprised. Yes, to you, I was very surprised. What does this Distinguished Service Award uh, mount to? What does it mean? Well, uh, it means a great deal to librarians. Uh, it has been, I think, for about 15 years, it's not given every year. I believe only seven people have ever received it. And it's given to people, who, uh, to librarians, to professional librarians who've had at least 10 years service in their profession. But the award itself is given in a year when this person is, has contributed beyond their actual job. I'm a, non, I'm a non salaried unemployed librarian <laughs> right now, but I did receive it for the work on the code. Mr. Lowe is, is a recipient of that award also. Francis Kennedy, the librarian at OCU, is another one. Well, congratulations to you. Well, I'm very thrilled. And Earl, you might uh, tell us, what now that the code has been passed, yes. 
What does this mean for small counties who don't have a library? Well, one, it means that uh, there is a state library board, an overall or supervising agency, or really a helping agency, which can advise these uh, smaller counties and can help them. And then it also means, and this again, I get back to my experience in city government, that under the code, the cities themselves in each county will have a representative on the multi-county library board. And then very importantly, it means that this state board will set up standards, you know, achievements or goals to attain. And they will, upon request, come and look at libraries and say, well, you need help in your children's part. You need help in your reference part. And I've worked under standards and accreditation in my law school days. And I think it's very, very helpful to have some outside agency come in and say, do this, you should do this, and so on. Yes. Well, Beth, do you think it means then that there is a possibility that every county in Oklahoma will eventually have a library of its own? We, we certainly hope so. Another thing that it will do is uh, it strengthens the state library in, in creating a department of state governments, the State Department of Libraries, which will make it them be able to help these libraries. Well, do we, ha we have a state department for libraries. We have a state library, which has an expansion division. This code this is located at the Capitol. Yes, this yeah. code calls for a reorganization of the state library into a state department of libraries, which will be on a level with the state department of education. And have will it be located in Oklahoma City? At yes. The yes, there is a new state library building going to be built. But this agency would have the same responsibility for libraries over the state and for library services the State Department of Education and, and the department and its board has. Bill, the interest in libraries is really heartening. I spoke at uh, Selford to the Chamber of Commerce three weeks ago, and the thing they asked me to talk about was multi-county library. I was in uh, Guthrie uh, last Monday night, and they asked me then to speak about multi-county library systems. So but they're all interested in this. There, there Jeff, um, I think you could share with us, if you will, pardon for the interruption, okay. about the uh, governor's library, which was just officially opened last week. And uh, yes. how is this to be supported, and what, what is it going to be? Well, as, as a celebration of National Library Week, uh, the uh, Library Association decided that they would like to present to the Governor's Mansion as a permanent uh, collection a family uh, library, a family reference library. And it, is, uh, being, it, it has already been presented to, to the mansion, and uh, the members of the Library Association are uh, uh, contributing uh, a book to, to the library. And it'll be permanently there as part of the in mansion all, and books of all, in all fields, I presume. That's right, in all fields. I was in the mansion not too long ago, as I suppose many people in Oklahoma, and I noticed with great interest, even before I heard about what Beth was talking about, Bill, they had a set of Oklahoma statutes, those are law books, and a few miscellaneous books from the University of Oklahoma Press. That was it. All the rest of the shelves oh. were just bare. I'm mm -hmm. delighted that we're going to have a permanent library for the governor's mansion. And it's been a joy talking to Mrs. Beth Hyman and Earl Sneed about libraries in Oklahoma and in celebration of National Library Week. Thank you very much for being with us this morning. And thank you for being with me on Open Minds.